If there wasn't a birth, there would be no death, no resurrection, no life eternal. That is why we celebrate the birth. The birth is the beginning of it all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. whatever words you want to use to just praise him this morning.
If there was no birth, there would be no death, no resurrection, and no eternal life. That is why we celebrate the birth. That's why those last two lines are so important. Jesus loves now to come to the altar. We are going to pray for all those that need a healing touch from the Lord right now. All those that's grieving. Hallelujah. Lord, we come to you this day. Give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Thank you for bringing us here this day so we can gather once more. We lift up all those that are sick in body right now. We lift up Adrian, Janet, Julian, Lozan, Paulette, Shirley Ann, Carolyn, Jennifer S., Kay, Janet's sister, Pam, Terry Ann, Vernon. Lord, I ask you to touch them from the top of the head to the bottom of their feet. Lord, you are the great physician. Lord, what man cannot do, you can do. Nothing is too big for you not to handle. I ask you to bring healing to them. Take away their pain. You know every cell, every tissue, oh God, in their body, oh God. And we claim healing this day. Thank you, Jesus. We claim it in your name. Lord, we lift up um, those that's grieving. Lift up um, Verona's family and um, Veronica and Nicola and um, Ben and Ken family. Especially Angie right now, oh God. Angie and Devante. The passing of her grandson, oh Lord. You alone know the pain, oh God. Lord, you, I know you say that you give and you take it away, Lord Jesus. But oh Lord, help us not to mourn like those that haven't got any hope. We have a hope in you, O oh Lord, and we know, O oh God, one day we'll be reunited with them. Jesus, take away their grief and their sorrow, O oh God. Lord, comfort them, give them strength, and give them your peace, the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, I ask you to touch Carrie Ann this week as she's going in for surgery. Be the surgeon in that hospital room, oh God. Guide the surgeons and let them be, let her come through with, without any difficulty in Jesus' name. Um, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Give you all the praise, oh God. And we put everything in your hands, in your name. Thank you. Amen.
A reading from Luke 2, chapter 25 to 32. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people, Israel. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for reading scripture today, Brenda and, and Annette, for praying. How many of you are excited for Christmas time? Really? That's it? See, I'm excited for Christmas time. Let me ask again how many of you are excited for Christmas time? How many of you have grandchildren or children that are beyond excited for Christmas time? That know that it's only 14 days until Christmas. Nobody has children or grandchildren that are that excited? Man, I could tell you, my kids from two months ago knew how many days it was till Christmas. And they're grown. I love Christmas time. I've always loved Christmas time. See, as a kid, we didn't, I didn't come from an affluent family. I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, Ontario. And all through the year, Whenever I'd ask for something, my parents would say, mm, not right now, or maybe later, or we don't have the money for that right now. But Christmas time, the things that I had asked for through the year somehow found their way under the Christmas tree. But we opened our gifts Christmas Eve. But Christmas Day was one of my favorite days of the year. And the reason for that is living on a farm, we always had stuff to do. There was always work to do. But when it came to Christmas, we laid the work aside. And we got to spend time as a family. And we got to play board games. And we got to talk and joke around and laugh. And it was just a day where there was nothing to do. And I could never wait for that. And I still get excited about Christmas time. See, the reason we sing Christmas carols from the beginning of November... It's because I just can't wait. I love Christmas. And there are so many Christmas carols that we only get to sing maybe once a year. And I don't think that's fair. Because they're just so much fun to sing. And I hate waiting for Christmas. I hate it. But I don't try to figure out my gifts because that's the most fun for me. I just, I don't want to know. But... Waiting for Christmas, when it is a week away, when it is two days away, when it is the day before Christmas, the anticipation is palpable. You can feel it. There's something about Christmas, isn't there? And waiting is an issue for us. And it's not just at Christmas time. We've talked about this. We hate to wait. And let's be honest, the reason we hate to wait is because it all comes back to Genesis 3. See, when Adam and Eve didn't wait 
for the best that God had to give them and took it upon themselves to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they broke a covenant with God. And since then, we've all inherited that innate ability to not want to wait. I mean, think about this for a minute. We live in a microwaving, FedExing, fast food eating, high speed internet, same day delivery kind of world. And we're talking about this on Seniors Sunday. Now, see, my parents had this phrase that I never understood. And I never felt gratification at all with this. And they called it delayed gratification. Everybody knows what that is, right? And to me, that's not nearly as fun as instant gratification. Think about this for a minute. You pull into a gas station, and all the pumps are full. And you wait behind a car, and you watch as they put the handle back on the pump, and you start inching forward. Because you're next, you're getting that gas. And as they walk to their car, they decide at the last minute, they need to go into the store to get a pack of gum. Or a 649 ticket, or a Coke, or whatever they want. And you're left waiting at the pump going, why? Because you want to get your gas. Or you're late for an event. And you're driving, and what happens? You catch every red light along the way. Isn't that always how it happens? When you're on time or you're early, you're hitting every green. And you're like, no, oh, it's all right. I can catch a red today and slow down. I'm running early. Nope. But when you're late, every red light. It just happens that way. Or maybe you've been waiting for your passport in the last six months, and you've had to line up in those unending lines to get to the counter, to turn in your paperwork, to be told what? Now you have to wait because we have to process this. Oh. Waiting is impossible, isn't it? But maybe you're waiting for something more serious. Maybe you're waiting for the results of a medical test or for a new job or for a prodigal's child to come back to the Lord. Maybe you're waiting for that perfect spouse. Maybe you're battling depression or anxiety and you're waiting for those dark clouds that seem to be following you around to finally break and for a ray of sunlight to come through. The truth is, we all experience difficult times waiting in one form or another, no matter what we're waiting for. And the reason I'm talking about this today on Senior Sunday is because I want to take a look at a senior who could teach us how to wait. He was very, very good at waiting. And this man is Simeon. And through the story that Brenda read, we can learn a lot about waiting and hope from Simeon. He was an exceptional example of how to wait and hope. A senior man who waited on the Lord to keep his promises to him. He didn't waver in his hope or his belief. He just believed and trusted that what the Lord said he would do, he would do. And for that, he was called devout and righteous. And as much as we find it difficult to wait... The Word of God deals a great, says a great deal about waiting. It's actually mentioned over 150 times in the Bible. We're commanded to wait upon the Lord, to wait for the Lord, to wait patiently, to wait for the promises to be fulfilled, to wait in hope. And there's always a purpose behind God 
telling us, wait. You see, Jesus could have healed Lazarus before he died. He heard that Lazarus was sick. But he waited till Lazarus was dead, wrapped, put in the ground, and buried. God could have made David king as soon as he was anointed by Samuel. But he had to wait for 15 years, most of which were spent doing what? Hiding and fleeing from his own father-in-law who wanted to kill him. Moses spent 40 years tending sheep in a desert before God called him back to Egypt to lead the Israelites out. Joseph suffered 13 years of slavery and imprisonment before he had the chance to be a leader in Egypt. God could have given Abraham a son at a young age, but waited till he was 100 years old before he gave him a son. So the question is, why? Why does God make us wait? Because what God does in us while we're waiting is just as important as what we're waiting for. Let me repeat that because I need you to remember this. When you're in a time of waiting, it's just as important what God is doing in you during this time of waiting as what we're waiting for. Waiting is part of the process where God works in us and he does in us what he needs to do to make us who he needs us to be. Waiting isn't a punishment. It's an opportunity to grow. It's preparation for something bigger. Waiting builds strength, faith, trust in the Lord our God. If he's making us wait, it's for a good reason. If he's telling us no today, it's because he has a better yes for us tomorrow. So since we've all waited at one point in time or another, I think it's important that we look at Simeon and see what he has to teach us about how to wait in hope. See, you can have the right knowledge. And by the right knowledge, I mean the word of God. You need to have the right knowledge in order to wait in hope, right? Because if you're not firmly planted in the word of God, you're not going to wait in hope. You're going to wait and you're going to hope, but you're not going to wait in hope. Having the knowledge of God allows you to wait in hope, not wait and hope. See, we can be tempted to put our faith in things that are inevitably going to disappoint us. We can wait that a doctor will heal us, a teacher will pass us, a spouse will love us again, our employer will reward us, a friend will come through in the end. But it's only when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we're not going to be put to shame. See, Simeon remembered all the things that God had done in the past. And he knew that God always kept his word. And since God kept his word, he knew that he would live to see the Messiah. Simeon was willing to wait in hope, even if it meant waiting for decades to get the answer. And having the right knowledge helped Simeon wait. See, having knowledge in God helped Simeon wait longer, and it made his wait easier because he got to see 
what the Lord was doing. Despite being surrounded by Roman occupation of Israel. Despite having darkness and hopelessness all around him. Having the right knowledge helped him understand the plans that God had. This is what Apostle Paul was referring to in Romans 12 too, when he says that in order for us to know what God is up to, we must renew our minds with the word of God. Simeon certainly lived by that principle. He was renewing his mind in the word of God. He made sure he had the right knowledge so that he was able to understand and see the things that were going on around him that other people missed. See, we talked last year about King Herod, remember? When the wise men came to him, what did he do? He called the chief priests, he called the magistrates, he called all the wisest people in his kingdom together to gather the information about where and when Jesus would be born. Where is this king of the Jews, he wanted to know. But because he didn't have the right knowledge, he missed it. He had the smartest people in his land working on a problem that they had all the information to, but because they didn't have the heart knowledge and the knowledge of God, they missed it. Simeon didn't miss it. He knew how to wait in hope. He knew how to have the right knowledge and how to keep the right knowledge. He knew how to wait. Listen, church, we can fill our heads with knowledge each and every day. We can watch the TV. We can read the internet. We can listen to podcasts. We can talk to our friends. We can read books. We can listen to every source of information we want. And it's amazing how much information we put in our heads in a day. But none of this knowledge will help us wait in hope. Only having the right knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ gives us the right hope to wait. God's word and God's word alone is unshakable. We can wait in the Lord knowing that no matter how dark the night gets, the morning's coming. And the light will break through in our lives and in our situations. And sometimes we feel totally impatient when it comes to waiting on God, don't we? We feel frustrated. We feel lost. We feel a disconnect. We feel like sometimes he's not even hearing our prayers. But we're tempted to take things into our own hands sometimes, aren't we? But having the right knowledge continually helps us make that decision day after day to say, God, I know the promise you gave me and I'm holding on to it. I'm trusting in you completely. There is no plan B here. You're either going to do this or I'm going to die waiting for you to. The Lord knows what he's doing in your life, in your school, in your career, in your relationships. And though we think we know the situation inside out, we don't know what a fraction of how well he understands it. Friends, if he promised it, it will come to pass. He will do it. He will see it through to completion in your life. And this leads us to the second thing that we have to do in order to wait and hope. And that's live in the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the interesting thing here is the Holy Spirit's mentioned three times in this passage. The Holy Spirit was on Simeon. The Holy reveal, the Holy, it had been to, revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit. And Simeon was moved by the Spirit. Friends, Simeon lived before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He lived prior to Acts 2. And yet he's an exceptional example of what the Holy Spirit's power can do because of his capacity to wait. Friends, 
Friends, trust me, I've experienced the frustration of having to wait continually to see something come to fruition. I've trusted the Lord in his promises, but sometimes failing to see the, fit, the tangible manifestation of those answers. And you get tired and you get restless and weariness comes along. But I can tell you the Holy Spirit always gives you the power, the strength, the supernatural ability to endure. Scripture tells us that God made Simeon a promise. He would not die until he saw the Messiah. And it was the Holy Spirit that gave Simeon the supernatural strength, the patience, the faith to believe God's promise. Church, when we live in the power of the Holy Spirit, your waiting isn't passive. You're not sitting around biding time, doing nothing until God answers that promise. That's not how this works. You can move about, continue to live, and know that the Holy Spirit will lead you where you need to go. See, Simeon had the right knowledge, which meant he could discern the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to him and directing him even among all the noise of the world that he was living in. He knew when the Holy Spirit was speaking to him. And as the months went by, and they turned into years, his faith didn't deter because his faith wasn't based on circumstances that man controlled. His faith wasn't based on a calendar. So as days went by and turned into months and months to years and years to decades and his life was almost spent, he never gave up hope. He continued to trust that promise. And when the day that the Holy Spirit prompted Simeon, go to the temple, he didn't wait. He didn't question. He got up, he never doubted, and went to the temple. And on that same day, a poor young couple walked up the steps of the temple to fulfill their Jewish obligation of offering a sacrifice for their son. And when Simeon saw them, he knew his wait was over. But here's the thing. Scripture tells us he took Jesus in his arms, lifted him up, blessed God for his faithfulness. The Messiah is here, a savior, not only for the Jews, but for the whole world. And he says, sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. the faith that that must have took to take this baby and proclaim this. The thing is, he didn't look, Jesus didn't look any different than any other baby that Simeon had seen in his long life. There was nothing unique about him. Can you imagine this scene, the Messiah being held by this man who was led by the Holy Spirit to know that he was the Messiah. He was in Simeon's arms. He was holding the one who was the fulfillment of all God's promises because he'd waited and knew that when God promised he would do something, he would do it. Some say Simeon's role in the Christmas story is insignificant. That's not the case at all. Think about this for a minute. If Simeon hadn't been in there, this would have been missed. See, Mary and Joseph are two nondescript, non-prominent, not well-known people. And God put in their hands the redemption of the world. Did they fully grasp the magnitude of that? Probably not. 
Their baby looked, acted, functioned like every other child. Of course, they knew because of the promise that they'd been given that he was the son of God. He was God incarnate. But when Simeon spoke and held their baby and said that he was the redemption of the world, their knowledge of their child expanded to understand that he was the perfect lamb, that he was the once and for all sacrifice that would die for the sins of the world. Had it not been for Simeon, who knows when or if they ever would have fully understood that. The thing is, from the time that Simeon received the promise of the Lord that he would see the Messiah before he died, he probably woke up each and every day saying, today the day? Is today the day? And as he got older, he might have started to think, when is this going to happen? The thing is, he didn't know what he was even looking for. What was he to expect? Was he going to be out for a walk one day and the sky would open up and a king would come down on a cloud? Or maybe it would be in the dead of a starless night. A ray of light would shine and a king would come from the heavens. Or maybe he would come as a conquering warrior through the eastern gates as the prophets foretold. And he would set up Israel and he would overthrow the Romans and he would be the conquering king that they expected. See, we don't know what Simeon thought, but we certainly know what he got. A little baby that looked no different from anyone else. Held in the arms of a poor, poor couple that couldn't even afford to buy a lamb to offer as a sacrifice, so they had to use a bird. Yet Simeon, filled with the Holy Spirit, was able to identify that this was the Messiah that the world needed, and that's all he needed. No wonder he was ready to die. His hope had been fulfilled. His joy was complete. His heart was at peace and at rest. He was ready to die because he had seen God's salvation for all mankind. Friends, this morning salvation is for everyone. Don't for a minute think that God isn't a saving God. He wants us all to be saved, and the only way you can be saved is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no other way to salvation, Acts 4.12 tells us. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given by which man must be saved. When Simeon calls Jesus God's salvation, prepared for all nations, this is a reminder to us of the commission as believers to share the gospel with those around us. So I'm asking you this week to share the gospel with one person. One person at work, one person in your family, one person in your neighborhood. And I know it seems like It's a small task, but it's a big task because let me ask you, how many of you shared the gospel with somebody last week? And if each one of us shares the gospel with one person this week and one person next week, eventually that will turn into a snowball and the people that we're ministering to will minister as well. We are we are talking about making a greater difference in our community for the kingdom of God. And isn't that what TLC is called to do? We're not called to wait in hope in silence. We're called to wait in hope, but share that hope 
with those around us. So when you have an opportunity and you see somebody that's living without hope or they're waiting and hoping, share your ability to wait in hope with them. Let them know why Christmas is such an important time of year for you as a Christian. Because it's only when we share this knowledge that we can expand their knowledge and we can expand the kingdom of God for the betterment of everyone. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the example of Simeon, Lord God. Lord God, let us wait in hope, Father, knowing that everything you said you would do, you will do. Because when you promise something to us and for us, Lord God, we know that you'll be just and faithful to see it through to completion. Lord God, give us the ability this week to share with those around us. Let us stand strong this week. As we may come up against opposition, let us not back down or be afraid, Lord God, but let us move in the power of the Holy Spirit and trust the words that he has given us. And that these words will find a mark. Bless us this week. In your name we pray. Amen.